All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our plant propagation workshop. I have a little mini plant propagation <laughs> zone set up on my couch right now. Um, and I'm so excited that you all are here this evening. So let's see where everybody is coming in from. If you just joined the chat, you're welcome to write where you're zooming in from. Um, maybe how you heard about our class tonight, and maybe a specific question you have too around plant propagation, if there's one that really brought you to the call tonight. Um, but my name is Megan. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. I work for a nonprofit called Heal the Planet. We are located in South Florida. I grew up here in South Florida. And I like to preface my classes by telling you all that I had very little awareness of the living world growing up. So if I can do this stuff, you can do this stuff. Um, many of the techniques that you're gonna to learn today are so wonderful and so useful no matter where you are zooming in from. Um, we're gonna keep it very basic, very simple. We have a special guest on the call tonight, my friend Richie. He's gonna be giving a little um, talk on pineapples as well as air layering. So he's gonna do our air layering section of the class. Um, but I, I met Richie years ago, there he is. I met Richie years ago at the Urban Farming Institute, which is a nonprofit here in Oakland Park, Florida. Um, and he was a star student. And I learned that he has around 800 pineapples growing in his backyard at last count. Um, and he just has a small suburban lot like all of us here in a pretty busy urban environment. So I thought it'd be useful to bring Richie in because he has become a master in air layering, specifically with figs recently. Um, so he's gonna do a little talk for us a little later in the call, talk about pineapples. It's pineapple season here. Um, and let's most of all just have fun tonight. So I preface my nature tours by saying that I'm gonna present a lot of information to you all tonight. So don't try and remember it all. Uh, just receive the information, let it come through. Like I said, we record the calls as well too. So if you wanna revisit a certain topic, you can visit our YouTube page in about a day or two. And all of our classes are posted on there since we started doing these online workshops. Uh, yes. So Noelia just said, Noelia is our executive director. Noelia is on the call. Noelia, do you have any announcements that you'd like to make? There she is. So she's muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Megan. Well, I'm super happy to have you in this call, everyone. I'm so excited to see people from different places are joining our Zoom today. Uh, one of the things that we need is if you can kindly mute yourself because we are recording this and the background noise is a little bit, um, it interferes with Megan's uh, speech. So that would be great. This Saturday, we have a ceremony at Snyder Park. So if you're local, we invite you to join us. And also at night, we have a big night out. It's a vegan party. It's happening in Fort Lauderdale. You can find all the information in our website, healtheplanet.com. And if you go to calendar, you will see everything that's going on. You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook, and you will find out everything that Heal the Planet does for the community. Another thing that I like to uh, share with you is that all the programs that we do are free of charge. And if you fill the call and you like this class and you want to donate, you can go to our website and do that. Five, ten dollars if you feel it's um, something you want to do. We really appreciate it because everything that we do for the community is free of charge. So thank you so much for being here and I'll leave uh, Megan to continue. Thank you, Noelia. Zooming in from San Francisco. She's at the bridge right now. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, I think I went through and muted any mics that weren't muted. And it's not that we don't want to hear you all speak and contribute. But as we know, after about a year and a half of Zooming, it can become quite chaotic when we have all the background noise. So 
Everybody's zooming in from Boston, Central Florida, Colorado Springs, Clemens, North Carolina, Massachusetts, another Massachusetts, and Fort Lauderdale. Bettina has a question about copper plant, and Noelle asks us to mute ourselves. All right, so let's dive in because we have a lot to discuss tonight. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and I will have a select few. I, don't, I never know who it is, but there are my eyes on the ground to make sure that I am still <laughs> um, zooming or that you can still see my screen. Okay. So the select ones are Noelia, wow, great. And Richie, who is also our, our fellow student. So Richie, I can't see your screen. Um, Richie, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see our share screen? Yes? Yes, he sees it. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Richie. All right, so let's begin. So welcome to our plant propagation workshop. Um, this first photo I have here is to bring you a little bit of hope. Um, one of the first plants that I ever propagated was elderberry, which has been a plant that has become quite well known in the last um, year and a half or so because of its qualities for helping with the respiratory system and the immune system. So. Um, I had graduated from my permaculture design certification and it was the middle of winter in Mississippi. Why was I there? Long story, but um, I was in Mississippi and I went to a friend's house and I took some cuttings from a dormant elderberry tree. I actually thought it was a mulberry tree even at the time, that's what I was told. So I took some cuttings, took a, a various cuttings of many plants, uh, but I took a cutting of an elderberry and I brought it home, well, I, I, brought, I stuck it into a pot and I eventually brought it home and planted it in my side yard right here. And I don't know if you can see it through the window, but it is now huge. It is blooming. So on the left, those are elder flowers. Elder flowers have a lot of medicinal and useful properties as well too. You can make an elder flower champagne with them. They have a naturally occurring yeast that you can work with to make fermented drinks. Um, you can also make elder flower pancakes and fritters. And then when those flowers are pollinated, they turn into elderberries, which you see on the right. And so from a seemingly dead mulberry tree, um, we received a gigantic elderberry bush that is now outside producing in abundance. So one cutting can really go a long way. So tonight we're gonna learn about how to take cuttings and just some simple strategies for getting a garden started. So what you see before you is my front yard. This is my front yard food forest garden. Um, and many of the plants in this photo were propagated from the strategies that we're gonna talk about tonight. So that beautiful yellow flower that you see right there is called Ternera. And I actually didn't even plant that Ternera. I was away and a seed. Somebody's mute. Mike is not muted. Let me go in. Give me one second, you guys. What do you think they're watching? <laughs> Mute, Frida. Um, I think we got it. Okay, back to the front yard. So that beautiful yellow flower was actually something that I didn't even plant. It was something that had planted itself. Um, on the right, that plant with the large leaves is turmeric. And to the right of that is with the kind of hangy seeds that you see that look like amaranth. That is callaloo, which is a relative of amaranth. And those seeds just blew in and Kalaloo loves to propagate through seeds, just moving around in that way. Um, yeah, so just to show you a little bit of hope, most of what I do, um, be it in our project in Snyder Park, um, for those of you who I haven't met before, uh, primarily what I do in the community is start community food forest gardens. Um, and the way that we do this is very low stakes by using these methods that you'll learn tonight, because it can be a lot of pressure to go to a big box store and purchase plants. Um, 
and purchase all the materials that we're told we need to purchase to start a garden. And so when we're able to propagate things from cuttings, it makes it much simpler and um, free as well too. So let's keep on rolling. So what is plant propagation? Um, plant propagation is the process by which new plants grow from a variety of sources, seeds, cuttings, and other plant parts. Plant propagation can also refer to the man-made or natural dispersal of seeds. So we're gonna talk about that. And propagation typically, typically occurs as a step in the overall cycle of a plant's growth. So plant propagation in short, growing plants from other plants and plant matter. So I would be remiss if I did not highlight the importance of soil. I'm teaching a permaculture design certification this summer and this week is our soil class. And I've just been really diving back into the importance of soil just personally as well too. And so having a good soil medium to propagate our plants and our cuttings in is very important. And so if you wanna review, I won't go into all of our soil building strategies, but there are a lot of ways that we can build soil for free using the resources that we have around us. And so we have a class specifically on soil on Heal the Planet's YouTube page that we did just like this. So you can visit that to learn some strategies. Um, we have a whole composting series on Heal the Planet's website as well too. So don't ever feel like you have to go out and buy soil. Instead, how can we build soil using the resources that we already have around us. So what you're looking at in front of you is the mycorrhizal network in a mulch uh, mountain that was dropped at my house. So if you're not familiar with this, tree trimmers have to pay to drop off mulch at the landfill. So when you hear those chippers going around your house or you've had your trees chipped, um, that plant matter is brought off to the landfill where it's mixed with our inorganic matter and creates a big methane mess and is also not harnessing that resource of, um, sorry, one second. Sometimes when I see things in the chat, okay, she's curious about plant crafting, great. <laughs> Sometimes when I see things in the chat, I'm like, oh my God, did it go off? But go ahead, feel free to contribute in the chat. I see Richie, Richie will be my eyes on the ground if I'm gone, just Richie, let me know. Um, so yeah, building soil is really important and we can do it with mulch very easily. Um, it's a resource that we have around us. And what you see that fuzzy stuff is the mycorrhizal network bacteria and fungi breaking things down in the soil. So feel free to revisit our soil class, but definitely the foundation of all growing is in the soil. A lot of times we think that we have to feed our plants, but we're focusing on feeding the soil because that's our foundation. It's kind of like our guts. We have good, strong, healthy guts. We're able to absorb the nutrients that are given to us. And so focus on that as a grower and you will be perfect in the clear. Okay, so before we dive into things that we have to do as growers, um, what about the things that are already going on around us without us having to do anything at all? So I have people zooming in from all over the place tonight. Um, but for my friends in South Florida, do you recognize this plant? It is a weed that we see all over the place. And it is a weed that is not very well loved, though it has a lot of really important uses. This is Biden's Alba. Um, it's named the, or a Spanish needle. You can kind of see in that bottom, in the left-hand photo on the bottom, you can see it looks almost like a little starburst. Uh, those are the needles. And so, you can see there's two little teeth. That's where the name comes from, bidens, and then alba is white or Spanish needle. And the reason this plant is hated is because those little needles that you see right there will stick to your pants, uh, stick to your socks, stick to your cat's fur, stick to your dog's fur and make their way into your home or into your garden and they will spread. And so the name for these plants are hitchhikers because they're hitchhiking from place to place. Um, but also I find that Biden's is a really amazing pioneer plant and pioneer plants are plants that help to establish a system in really hostile conditions. So Biden's you can see growing out of a sidewalk crack. Um, 
these plants are really resilient and what they do is they create a little bit more of a less hostile habitat for life to grow and for soil to build underneath those plants. Um, so it starts with that bidens, but then it creates a little bit of shade, creates a little bit of uh, deciduous matter underneath, starts breaking up um, compacted soil and is a huge ally. So I'm sure that you have plants like this, wherever you're zooming in from, where it's a plant that is perceived of as a weed, but is actually quite useful. And so Biden's Alba not only is a useful plant in getting a system started, but it's also a bronchodilator. The flower that you see on the right, it helps to open up the lungs to help you to breathe, which is really important in a, emerging from a global pandemic. Um, it's the third most important nectar source for pollinators in our state. So you can see the little bee on the left just loving that Biden so much. And it's also very antibacterial and antiviral as well too. So before we even dive into like what we need to do through all these different strategies, just realizing that there's a lot of plants already growing around us that are useful allies. And so if you want to dive more into these weeds, as they're known, um, there's some great resources online. My, one of my favorite is called eattheweeds.com. It's run by Green Dean. And that's where I've learned a lot of what I know about this stuff. So um, if you happen to notice a lot of one plant around your garden that you didn't plant, I also find sometimes that it may hold medicine that you need. Just for example, I've lived next door to my aunt and she has asthma and this asthma weed grows all around her door. And so just noticing those plants that you have around you and seeing if maybe you don't even really have to do much at all because you already have some useful allies around you. Another amazing thing that happens without us doing anything at all are volunteer plants. And so um, we could consider hitchhikers to be volunteers, but usually volunteers are considered to be plants that came from our compost pile or plants that came from us scattering seeds in our yard or just putting like maybe some food scraps beneath a fruit tree. And so the eggplants that you see on the left were eggplants that popped up. I don't even know. I don't even eat eggplant that much. Like I said, I live next door to my aunt. Um, but it's amazing what comes up when we just allow space for things to grow as well too. So a lot of times we're very focused on controlling our environment, saying this belongs here, this doesn't belong here. But just another reminder that beautiful things can come to be like these dune sunflowers you see on the right, eggplants. I like eggplants, Baba Ganoush is great. Um, so just giving things a chance as well too to grow before you really even have to do anything at all. These plants, they're gonna grow. Another common volunteer that you'll see is tomatoes. I think a lot of you who are composting, hopefully you're composting. If you're not compo composting, definitely wanna encourage you to get started. Please visit our composting series. Um, but it seems like those tomato seeds, they really hang on and like to jump out of um, compost piles. Okay, so as we start to consider what it is that we want to propagate, thinking about perennials and annuals. So for some of you gardening experts out there, you may already know the difference between the two, but I think it's always important to cover um, what is a perennial and what's an annual. So a perennial is a plant that either sticks around. For us here in the tropics, we don't get a hard freeze. And so we don't really have a resting period each year. Um, things are constantly breaking down. We don't have that time for topsoil to really build. Um, though there is a slowing period because our winter is our dry season. Um, but there are plants that will die back, go to seed, and then come back the next year. Like right now I'm noticing a lot of cranberry hibiscus popping up all over the place. Cranberry hibiscus primarily um, blooms in the fall. And so right now those seeds that dropped probably in late winter are now starting to come up and color the ground a beautiful, bright, vibrant red, and then they'll grow up and by the fall, they'll be ready to bloom. So what you see on the left is comfrey, which is a amazing plant in many regards. Um, comfrey is a mineral accumulator. So um, we talk about this actually a lot in the soil class as well too. 
Comfrey is a plant that is a living plant food because it's able to pull minerals from the soil um, stored in its leaves. It's also really useful for healing bones. Um, but comfrey is really amazing at building soil. However, comfrey will die back here. I believe it will die back in temperate climates as well too. Definitely would if you got a freeze. Uh, but because it has this deep taproot system, it will grow back. Um, and then on the right, you can see mustard. So that's mustard flowers right there. So I primarily in my garden love to focus on perennial plants because they're plants that require less maintenance, um, produce an abundance and are oftentimes, they keep the garden full as well too. Um, provide a habitat. I just saw a little anole jump on um, the screen right outside in front of me in my garden. Um, so having that permanent place as well too is nice, but it's also fun to grow annuals too. So on the right is some mustard that I grew this last year and the mustard bolts, as we know, many greens will bolt, will send out flowers, the bees, the pollinators, as you can see right there. I call those cowboy bees because they look like they have like little spurs on their legs, <laughs> you can kind of see um, from collecting the pollen. Um, but that would be an annual, so it's something that dies back. However, you can save those seeds and plant them the next year. So focusing on a couple perennial plants, uh, perennial plants that grow in our place. So wow, there's cranberry hibiscus on the right, right there. So with the monarch butterfly on it, that was that plant I was just mentioning. Um, and you can see in the, to the left of the butterfly, you can see um, some seed pods. So the flowers of this plant will open, only open for one day and then they'll close back up, form seeds, and then form these kind of spiky looking pods. Um, and wow, there's a little anole in that picture too. This is kind of like find the thing in the picture, but can anyone see that tiny anole in the photo? Very cute on the red photo. Uh, that was that lizard I was just talking about. Um, and then on the left, you'll see that's the, if you're looking to the right of my front door from that first picture that we saw in the beginning, you recognize those yellow flowers. That was last rainy season with some abundant chaya going on. So chaya, which you see on the left right here, is also known as tropical tree spinach or Mayan tree spinach. And it is an all-star, easy to grow plant from cuttings. Another really easy to grow plant from cuttings is cassava or yucca. I'm really trying to sell cassava or yucca these days as the Florida potato because a lot of times my Floridian friends, you know, we're like, man, I want to grow white potatoes and I want to grow regular traditional spinach. But there are these tropical plants that really, really do so well in our place and really take so little effort at all. And so we need more of these easy to grow home run, home run plants that make us feel like all-star growers. And these two plants are definitely two of them. They also have kind of interesting leaf shapes that look quite similar. So there's me, I'm harvesting some yucca. So how do we grow yucca? So on the right, you can see some yucca tubers, but on the left, we see some cuttings. So if we go back to this photo, I'm kind of cutting off those tubers from the bottom. Um, but how this got started was just by planting one of those woody cuttings on the left. So in the left hand, uh oh, we got somebody else's sound. Who could it be? Let's see. Let's... All my dear friends out there, just making sure that you are muted. Got one. It's kind of like a little treasure hunt to see when you go through to see people in mute. All right, I think we got it. Um, so yeah, that woody cutting on the left is what we're gonna plant in the ground. So now we're gonna dive into, I believe in the next slide, um, actually seeing these kind of points. Um, but you can see on the left, there's these little nodes in the cuttings. And so those nodes are energy centers that leaves can come out that look like this on the right, that big hand, but also they're a point where roots can come out as well too. 
So when we're planting our cassava cutting, we want to plant it on its side with a little bit coming out from the top because those nodes will drop down those tubers that you see on the right that kind of look like sweet potatoes. And they're ready to harvest in eight or nine months, incredibly drought tolerant, and all started from a stick, which is pretty amazing. Um, a lot of times when we think about growing food, we focus on uh, lettuces, herbs, tomatoes, which are all wonderful, but to be able to grow calorie crops and substantial nutrition, man, you never feel cooler than when you pull a big old sweet potato or a cassava tuber out of the ground. You really are able to feed yourself and feel substantiated. So yeah, keeping it going with that, that talk about um, calorie crops. So on the left, we see a sweet potato and I'm gonna show you guys in a minute. I will, when we get to the cutting slide, I will take off the screen. Can, actually, I think you guys can see me on the side as well too, right? Um, I'm pretty sure you can. Richie, if you're there, can you see me on the side? <laughs> I'm holding a potato. <laughs> yes, I can see you. Okay, great. So yeah, I, I won't even take it down. I'll keep myself on the side and I'll show you guys from here. Um, so what we see on the left is a sweet potato. What we see on the right is turmeric or ginger. So a lot of plants will grow underground. This is how we grow these um, calorie crops, but also um, things like in the ginger family or turmeric family, malanga, taro. Um, so what do we do to grow a sweet potato? Actually, when I was out in my yard getting ready for show and tell, I was pulling up, I had an iguana, a big iguana in my yard, and it was hanging out on my fence, just quietly watching me because it had been eating my sweet potatoes earlier and it kind of like scurried up to the fence. And I didn't even notice it at first, but I looked over and it was just looking straight at me. Um, so I was like, well, I guess I'll pull this sweet potato up. So I pulled up this sweet potato here. I'm probably gonna get dirt all over my laptop. Um, but I thought it was so cool because this is the beginning of one of these tubers starting to form. Um, so you can see right here, it's quite purple. These are purple sweet potatoes, Molokai sweet potatoes. But you can do this with any sweet, any potato from the store, any sweet potato. So sweet potatoes are actually in a different family than our white potatoes. They're in the morning glory family. You can notice those vines, they look like morning glory vines. So all you're gonna do if you wanna grow a sweet potato is go to the store, get a sweet potato, organic sweet potato if possible, um, because sometimes they'll put waxy coatings on things like cassava, you'll notice that as well at the store. Um, so we don't want that waxy coating, we just want pure potato action. We're gonna cut off that top layer right there and then we're gonna stick it in a cup with some water. Here's my drinking water, but we're just gonna take that top, stick it in the water but make sure it's not touching the bottom because we want some water flow underneath. And then you're gonna start noticing shoots coming out of the top. Even if you just cut this off and like rested it in some soil, it'll start even if you don't do any of this. Like, have you ever gotten a sweet potato from the store and it starts sending out those shoots from the side? So those are how you get started. So you don't wanna plant the whole tuber at that time. Instead, you wanna kind of snap off that, um, shoot coming out from the side, tuck that into some soil, tuck it into the ground and then let it grow. Sweet potatoes also ready to harvest in eight or nine months. Not sure what that magic gestation number is, but eight or nine months seems to be the one. Um, on the right, another easy grocery store plant that you can grow underground is turmeric and ginger. So what we wanna do when we're planting turmeric and ginger, for my friends in the tropics, um, we, Ideally wanna get it in the ground at the beginning of rainy season, which is just starting to pick up now. Uh, but my friends in other places as well too, what a wonderful plant to grow in a pot, has beautiful leaves and is a very controlled environment where it has no competitors to pull, um, to compete with trying to grow those big juicy tubers. Um, so all you're gonna do is just bury one of those rhizomes in the ground just below the surface and we'll send out a little shoot, some new growth. You can actually use turmeric leaves as well to make tea, it makes a lovely tea. Um, and then you'll harvest once again, about eight or nine months, weird. Um, and the way that you know that it's ready to harvest is when 
the leaves die back and you're like, oh my God, my turmeric plant has died. But what is really happening is those leaves are dying off and it's signaling you that it's ready to harvest. I'm gonna take a sip of water. I see we got two things in the chat. So I'm gonna address that. Can ginger be grown in a pot? Absolutely. Spanish needle invasive, but bees love them. Delphine, I hope that you will fall in love with Spanish needle. I'm a big Spanish needle advocate. I know that it's a weed, but um, it has a lot of amazing uses as well too. I had a raging sinus infection at the beginning of the year. And I really do feel that Spanish needle helps so much in helping my sinus infection. I would just go out and nibble a couple of leaves per, per, per day because it's very antibacterial, antiviral. Um, and I also got stung in the face by a bee recently, like a month or two ago, it was crazy, got stung in the cheek. And those anti-inflammatory properties also got stung by red ants today. It's been a long day for me, but I got a bunch of red ant bites on my side. And so if you chew up those flowers, you can put it on bug bites or red ant bites because the anti-inflammatory properties help to relieve that as well too. So it's a weed, but a good weed. Yes, ginger can be grown in a pot. How are we doing on time? Oh my God, time flies when you're talking about plants. Let's die, let's keep going. Okay, so on the left, there's a turmeric flower. Right is turmeric and ginger again. Wow, must have been not noticing what I was doing. Okay, so another rhizome plant is banana. So who's ever tried to grow a banana or not tried to grow a banana and they chop down the banana and they're like, whoa, that banana is coming back with a vengeance. And so bananas, their life force energy is down in the rhizome. It's down at the base of the plant. And so you got to dig it up to get that banana out. But why do you want to get rid of that banana is my question, because bananas are delicious. But just another example of a rhizome plant sends out those pups from the side super easy to grow in our place. We have a whole video on our Heal the Planet um, composting series too about how to create a banana circle to get big racks of bananas like this. Because sometimes mm -hmm. people will be like, oh, you know, I bought a banana, it's a dud. Um, but the truth is, is the bananas love to be fed. And so what we feed bananas is not food, plant food oh. store. Oh, we got some oh, <laughs> There's a lot this call, you guys. What's going on? We've been zooming forever. All right, I got it, I think. And it's not even that I don't wanna hear you. It's just like so distracting, you know? Um, okay, so bananas, rhizomes, awesome, easy to grow and love to be fed. Um, they love to be fed your um, plant matter. There's more banana action. Okay, so we've arrived at cutting. So I finally get to do some show and tell for you all. Um, okay, so I'm actually gonna, let's go over this slide, but then I'm gonna make myself bigger so that you guys can see me more clearly um, for this little section that we're moving into. So primarily for cuttings, which is one of the easiest ways to grow plants, um, we wanna do it through um, soft cuttings or hard cuttings. Soft cuttings are easier to grow than hard cuttings, but don't be discouraged. Hard cuttings you can still do too. So before we take cuttings, we want to, first of all, ask for permission from the plant. And I know that this sounds a little bit out there, but the truth is, is that I have become a stronger grower and also a just more connected person with the plants in my place by asking for permission before I take from the plant. And I often find as well too, like my first job was at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens working with plants. And I remember my boss, he was not a very spiritual person in any way, but he was like, you know, if I don't ask permission, I'm in a bad mood before I take cuttings from a plant, they don't do as well. And so don't believe a word I say, I learned that from a teacher of mine. She says, don't believe a word I say, try it for yourself. So don't ask permission one time, take the cuttings, ask for permission, be like, hey, is it okay if I take some of these cuttings and see the difference in what happens and your mind will be blown. So first of all, we wanna ask for permission. Then we can follow lunar rhythms as well too. So where's the moon at right now? The moon is waxing towards full right now. 
we had a new moon a couple days ago. Um, and if I recall correctly, I believe it's in the sign of Leo. So you don't have to get too bogged down in the weeds around what sign it's in. Um, but we want to pay attention to when the moon is waxing towards full or waning towards new. So a good time to take cuttings is when the moon is waxing towards full because that energy is being pushed up into the plant. And this once again sounds a little bit out there, but if we think about the tides, the tides are ruled by this energetic pattern between the moon and the water on our planet. And so that's the same situation in the soil. So when we take those cuttings, when that energy is moving up rather than moving down, don't believe a word I say, just try it for yourself. Um, and then general rule of thumb for uh, taking cuttings and also for um, pruning a plant is we never want to take more than one third of the existing plant. And remember to take enough too so that you don't feel discouraged because you only took one cutting and it didn't take. Um, okay. Well, it's me again, really big. <laughs> okay, so let's dive into a little show and tell. So this is Cuban oregano. And I love Cuban oregano because as I was saying, we need more of these easy to grow home run plants. So Cuban oregano is really good at showing us where those energy points of growth nodes are. Um, Cuban oregano has a cousin over here. Um, this is known as toilet paper plant, uh, but also Plecranthus barbatus. It's in the same family. They're both in the mint family. You can kind of tell because it has that square stem. Um, but this one actually might even be a little bit better. It's a little crazy looking on the screen. Um, but you can see these points where leaves are coming out, small leaves, medium leaves, big leaves. And so what we want to do to propagate things is think about how much energy it takes for this cutting to maintain these leaves. You can see I took these probably 10 minutes before the call from my garden and you can see they're already starting to curl up because it takes a lot of energy to support these leaves. And what we really want the plant to be focusing on this time is um, conserving its energy and putting its energy into growing roots. So what we're going to do is kind of snap off some of these big leaves. So you can save these leaves, use them for toilet paper. <laughs> it's very soft. Um, or you can put them in your compost pile. What I'm doing right now is just removing all of these lower leaves. No matter what, we want all of our lower leaves to be removed, nothing in the way, because these growth points not only grow leaves, but they're also energy points for roots to come out as well. So just... Bearing with me here. So if you remembered in that graphic from the previous slide, how come those leaves were cut in half? So this is called flagging. And I wish that we were all together because right now what I would say is anyone have any idea why we would do that? Because I think it's important to also kind of think for yourself, but on the Zoom call, I'll just answer it myself. Um, so any idea why we do that? So what we wanna do is conserve that energy, but it probably is pretty stressful to remove an entire leaf as well too. So it's kind of that middle ground between um, removing the leaf fully and not removing that, or removing the leaf fully or not removing the leaf at all. <laughs> Um, so we have these small leaves at the top. We can leave those in. They don't seem like they take a lot of energy to take care of. But here it is. It's our cutting. So it's kind of a little wonky. This one I probably would stick in sideways to let these root nodes come out. Um, but you can also cut it as well too. So when we're taking cuttings, we want to cut below these nodes right here. So say you are at a friend's house or you come visit Snyder Park, we're gonna be doing this in person. Uh, you take some cuttings from the toilet paper plant or its cousin, Cuban oregano. Uh, you get home, it's always nice to make a fresh cut at the bottom. There's some plants where it's nice to let it scab over. Plumeria is one of those. Um, like I said, you can get so bogged down in the details. And I know I'm in the tropics. Um, but all of these plants, just learn them one at a time. So you go to your friend's house, you're like, whoa, toilet paper plant, that's crazy. I wanna bring that home with me. 
So you got your pruning shears in your bag or in your car. Um, you take a little cutting, you get home, you remove your lower leaves, you use them to make tea, uh, put them in your compost pile, whatever you wanna do. And then you wanna make a fresh cut just below that node right there. So I'm gonna cut that off. And actually on these hardy plants, you could even plant this in the ground as well too, or into a pot. So right here is giant milkweed. So after our last Friday class, um, there was some milkweed on the ground, some giant milkweed. So I took a cutting from it and I stuck it in a pot and you can even see right here, there's some new growth coming out from this milkweed cutting already. So that little energy point right there, even though some of these things can look dead, like just a stick in and of itself, um, you stick it in some soil and that life force energy is inside of the stem itself. So a good way to tell if your cutting has taken is to kind of gently pull on it. And you can kind of, honestly, that's not even the best approach. What I like to do is a little gentle scrape. So this cutting is green. Let me see if I have any woody cuttings around. This is Mexican sunflower. So this looks pretty woody. So like, say I had this cutting and I was like, is this still alive? If I scraped on it, you can see that there's still green inside. So this is a good rule of thumb as well for a tree too. Like, did my tree die? Scrape and see if that cambium is still alive inside of the plant. So a little harder to tell on the giant milkweed, but a good sign is if leaves start coming out. Also, it'll kind of shrivel up as well too. So this is just in a little mix of potting soil. You can make your own potting soil um, using compost, mulch. We have seaweed as well too. Uh, but if you want to skip that step, just buying a high quality uh, potting soil for sure, because uh, that's really going to make you a lot more successful as a grower, especially if you're growing food as well, too. We want to focus on good things. Okay, so here's our little cutting. We can stick it in some soil. I got this demo pot right here. So what I would do with this one is kind of nestle it in. And so for our cuttings, we want to keep them pretty moist. So once I've stuck it into the soil down to the point where, this is challenging to do on Zoom, I've never taught um, of these on Zoom before. Um, but what we wanna do is nestle it into about the leaf line, and then we wanna keep our soil relatively moist for the most part. Um, so for my friends in the tropics, it's rainy season, just keep it outside. I'm gonna talk a little bit about starting a nursery at the end. Um, but that is cuttings in and of itself. I have a lot of other things that I could show you cuttings of, but does anyone have any questions on that? Cause I definitely want to have time for what's coming up with Richie cause it's very exciting. So anyone have any questions in the chat? I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm just going to show you Cuban oregano. Cuban oregano can even grow just from a leaf too. Like you can just rest a leaf on something and it will grow. Less energy from sun. So any questions on cuttings, you guys? Do you feel confident on it? I hope you do. Stick this in our little demo pot. Who else we got over there? I got Katak, but we'll hold off on Katak for now. Um, but this is Mexican sunflower, really amazing. Okay, we got some questions. But Mexican sunflower, really easy to grow. I'm cutting once again below that point. And then we could get a couple cuttings out of this one. Another thing to keep in mind too, when you take your cuttings is making sure that the right side is up as well too. So this can be a little tricky, but um, maybe making a little mark at the top of the plant, like with your finger or your thumb, also becoming aware of which way the node is shape, um, facing. Sometimes they'll face down, sometimes they'll face up. We definitely want that cutting to be right side up as well too. So woody cuttings would be things like rosemary, uh, Mexican sunflower. Wow, this even has little seeds saved on it. We're gonna talk about seeds, but here's the seed saved, seed head. Let's get to your questions. Do you ever use sprouting powders? Excellent question. That's our next slide for allies. So I'll show you what I use for that. Um, if I water right away, it won't rot the root. Good question. Um, so what we wanna do, honestly, the easiest thing to do is when you have your pot of soil, you're getting ready to uh, propagate your cuttings, 
get the soil in, make it nice and damp, like the consistency of a wet sponge. We don't want it to be soaking wet, but we want it to be like a nice damp environment for roots to come out. Um, and from there, hold on one second, I wanna make sure everybody's muted. Um, from there, we will stick our cuttings in, cause sometimes when you stick the cuttings in when it's dry, they'll move all over the place when it gets wet. Um, but yes, we definitely want some moisture to get started. Um, if I water right away, what would I cut from scented geranium in Massachusetts? Um, I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with scented geranium, but when it comes to a specific plant, um, what I would do is just focus on um, looking at propagation for scented geranium. So, Perhaps scented geranium, I have a feeling, might be relatively similar to orange jasmine, which Richie's actually going to show a video of, but I can't say for certain because I'm not familiar with it. But using these strategies of taking the cuttings just like this, um, and now I'm going to tell you what you can stick the cuttings in as well too to help enhance that process, um, is definitely worth a try. Always put cutting in soil or do you ever put in water? You guys are on top of it. So let's dive back into the slideshow because I got a couple more on cuttings here. And we're gonna hand it off to Richie. Share our screen. All right, can you see me? Yes. Thank you, Richie. Um, okay. Sorry, for some reason I cannot. <laughs> access the slideshow view show. Okay. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay. So, okay, yeah, we covered everything. Okay, so how to root plants in water. So choose the right plant. Um, like we said, once again, just focus on one plant at a time. So I know basil is one that likes to root in water. Another amazing one, I have like a 40 year old compost plant that used to be at the top of my parents' stairs. So I think that's probably what it's showing in that picture right there. So pothos is in the philodendron family. They're excellent house plants, great for purifying air. Um, and so taking a cutting from the pothos plant, sticking it in some water, and I just like to stick these around my house as well. Too. Recently, my mom was here and she was like, Megan, you got too much pothos around. I was like, mom, this is your pothos. It was your pothos. There's the pothos right over there. <laughs> um, but sticking it in some water. And then in this one, it says choose the right vase. But as you can see, this is a blue, um, I believe it was a sake bottle. Um, but there's still some roots coming through. So let's see if we can pull them out and see what's going on here. So you can see some roots have started to form. Um, but if you have a clear jar, you can really see it better. But something I, I truly believe as well too is that when we propagate things in water, they aren't as strong of plants. I don't want to say that while I'm writing this topic. I do find that plants are stronger directly into soil. All right, pop those prop to the side um, and use the right water. So just focusing on rainwater if you've caught rainwater or filtered water. Um, okay, so propagation allies. So Someone in the chat was asking about uh, sticking cuttings into some sort of medium to help to um, make the cuttings more fruitful. So aloe can be, so you can buy rooting hormone. I think that was what was asked in the chat. Um, but I like to focus on plants that we already have around us. I try and go to the store as little as possible to buy things. And so something I've had great success with is aloe, which is a plant that you can grow anywhere if you it's a great house plant here in the tropics we can grow it outside year round um, but if you think about it like look at that juicy aloe on the left like what are the properties of aloe for me growing up I got a bit of a sunburn today I also got fire ants and a sunburn today um, for me I always knew aloe as something to help soothe the skin right 
So picture what would happen if we put a little bit of aloe on the tip of our cutting. It's going to make a nice soothing environment to heal and to regenerate. And so what you can do is slice open a filet of aloe, rub your cutting tip in that aloe um, juicy part right there, and then stick that into the soil. And I have had great success doing that. You can also blend up the leaf and like make your own little rooting hormones, stick it in that it's a little bit faster and easier, store it in the fridge. Um, Cinnamon is a good one for if you are um, trying to uh, sterilize things. So cinnamon is often used when we're like taking cuttings from orchids. I know people with orchids can be very, um, like my grandma, she worked with orchids. It really taught me a lot about cleanliness with tools and things like that. So cinnamon is good for um, keeping things nice and clean. Healthy soil, we've already mentioned. Um, consistent curiosity, can't emphasize that enough because if we take a cutting from a friend's house and it doesn't root and we give up, then that's a bummer, you know? We wanna keep our head in the game and we wanna keep trying, you know? And so take enough cuttings and have fun with it and be low stakes about it. What I do is I have a little nursery on the side of my house. I'll go places like today, I'm pretty sure I have a seed in my pocket that I forgot about that's probably in my laundry bin right now from a Quimuck tree tasted my first Quimac today, stuck the seed in my pocket, go home, stick it in a pot with some soil and just see what happens. And always label things as well too. You can see I got a little label right here and that's just on a, like a wooden stick. You can also just put a little label on it. Um, and then reciprocity and relationship. I can't emphasize that enough that having that relationship and uh, respect with living systems really makes us really strong growers when it comes to propagation. All right, Richie, it's almost your time to shine. So food scrap gardening, that is growing plants from our food scraps. On the left, I've got some daddle peppers, um, but I put these peppers in because my aunt who lives next door to me, she has never really been much of a grower, but for some reason she saw something on online about like growing peppers from seeds. And she was like, wait a minute, you can grow peppers from the seeds in a pepper? And so this was the first year that she has grown full pepper plants and um, was able to eat her own peppers, which is pretty cool. So sweet potatoes would be another example of that. Who's ever grown an avocado from a pit as well too? Um, and then my favorite is pineapples. So I'm gonna hand it off to Richie now. So Richie, if you'd like, um, you can unmute, you're already unmuted. And I will just click through the slides. Can everyone see Richie? Let me see, replace pin. There he is. Can everyone see Richie? I can. I can't see you. <laughs> I can't see my camera. All right, well, we can hear you at least. So if you want, you can speak and we'll see if you show up on the YouTube video later. Sometimes it's a crapshoot. I don't know if it shows up, but Richie is a gorgeous superstar just so you know what he looks like. And he is a pineapple hero. So take it away on pineapples, Richie. Well, hello everybody. Um, I started growing pineapples probably about 15 years ago. I started with store-bought pineapples and um, grow the tops of the pineapples, which are called the crowns. Um, and one day I happened to be in one of the box stores and they had these pineapple plants for sale. And I purchased a couple. They were different than the ones that they sell in the store, which are called um, smooth cayenne. And, um, I started growing these other pineapples and it turns out they are the most amazing pineapples you've ever tasted. They're a white pineapple that um, is called the sugarloaf pineapple. And um, by propagating pineapples, now I have several hundred plants. And um, can Megan, can you put up the slide with the, um, the, is it a little, um, yeah, that's, that'll work. Um, these are some of the pineapples I'm growing. And um, as you can see, there are some shoots around the base of this pineapple here. 
Those are called slips. There's um, pineapples produce different kinds of shoots that you can use to propagate your pineapple. Besides the crown, these slips here can be planted. And also, sometimes you'll get what they call suckers that come out from between, lower down on the plant, between the leaves. You're going to get some shoots coming out of there. And also, you can get some uh, shoots coming from the root of the pineapple plant. Now, a pineapple plant, once it produces a fruit, it's not going to produce any more fruits. But if, um, Megan, there's a picture of that one pineapple plant that I cut down that has, yeah, perfect. This is a pineapple plant that had produced, and I, you can see where I cut the plant down, and now it's producing shoots from the root. And these, these type of shoots are called ratoons. Um, so over the years, from each individual plant, you can get from maybe three up to eight or 10 different plants. And they accumulate rather quickly. And um, I just enjoy growing them so much. They're so easy to grow. They don't have any uh, pests. And um, I'm just fascinated with the taste of these things. I enjoy them too, Richie. I can vouch and say that these pineapples, any homegrown pineapple, tastes so much better than a grocery store pineapple. It's really hard to even express how juicy and amazing they are. And Richie also taught us about using pineapple skins as well too to make into pineapple skin tea. Um, so like the outside of the pineapple, the rind, you can boil that down and it has some amazing medicinal properties as well too. And when you get things from the grocery store, um, it oftentimes, we don't know what it's been exposed to. So when you grow things homegrown, you're really able to use that skin. All right. Yeah, here's a, this image here shows you the different um, parts of the pineapple plant that you can propagate from the slips, the crown, the suckers, Ready for the next one, Richie? Yeah, sure. Okay, Th this is a technique I just recently learned about called air layering. And this is a technique that's been around for years and years and years. Um, I find that this is a much better way to propagate your plants than um, grafting. Um, when you graft a plant, you have to wait years for that plant to produce fruit. When you air layer a plant, a plant you're gonna, it's going to produce fruit within a year. And um, basically what, what you do when you air layer the plant is you cut a section of the bark out and you're going to cover that with soil. Now, underneath the tin foil in the picture on the left, there's a, a, an old water bottle that has been sliced open and placed around the branch and filled with soil, moist soil. And you leave it there for a month or two. And um, you've got roots. As a matter of fact, I, I a, friend of mine, a friend of mine in New York just sent me a picture of one of his fig trees. He just propagated by uh, air layering with a half gallon jug uh, orange juice container. And the thing is just filled with roots. It's amazing how quickly plants will root this way. This is an orange jasmine tree. And, and the image on the right is after I cut that air layering off the tree, I planted it in a pot and um, we'll see how that's going to take. It's the first time I've ever attempted to air layer this orange jasmine. I've done it with fig trees many times. Figs are prolific root growers. This is an avocado tree of mine that th I was going to trim this branch that's too close to the ground. I was going to just trim it off and 
stick it in a compost pile. Instead, I took this milk container, made two slices down the front and back and cut two holes where the branch can go through it, filled it up with soil. And it's, um, I think in another month or so, I'm gonna check it for root growth and see how it does. I think it'll be okay though. It'll be, that's my first attempt at uh, air laying an avocado tree. But you can air layer almost all fruit trees. Um, I I wish I had a video of the technique, but it's. Oh, I was just about to say, Richie. I you said I had a hard time. Go ahead. You sent me the video earlier, so give me one second, and I'm going to see if I can pull up the video and share it because I saw the video, but I wasn't able to put it into the slideshow. So I'm going to see if I can show it. It's just a quick 30 second video of Richie showing when he reveals the roots on, um, let me see if I can find it. All right, I got it, I think. I was trying to videotape as I was air layering the thing, but I couldn't, it was hard to hold the camera and do the air layering. I tried several times to do a video, but it didn't come out. Yeah, well, he shows you the roots. So, man, I don't think I'm gonna be able to pull it up. Um, but something you guys can do is just look up air layering on YouTube as well too. And I'm sure there's countless videos of um, what it looks like. But essentially what Richie was explaining is that when you go up to, and that cambium we were talking about before that when we press into the um, stick, it's that life force energy inside of the plant. And so what we're doing is we're looking for that um, obviously the plant is alive. And so we're scraping back that cambium. Do you do that when you are air layering, Richie? Yes, you have to. Get, for, what you do is cut the bark off first and you have to scrape the cambium layer. So otherwise the bark will heal back. And yeah. It won't develop roots. So what you're um, doing is... Sorry, we're going to be, if, if anybody is on this Zoom class, it's going to be coming down to Snyder Park this weekend. We're going to be doing some air layering there and you can uh, try it yourself. Yeah, so we would love to see you guys in the park. I'm going to go over that when we get towards the end of our slideshow for our event this weekend. Um, and also, maybe if people are interested as well, too, they could, you can send a direct message to Richie and maybe he could send you that video as well, too, on the chat. Absolutely. All right, Richie, anything else you got to share before we uh, keep on keeping um, on? There might be some other, some there might be some other images I sent you of some air layering after you know what, of the root growth maybe. But. Let me see. I think the the last one that I have is the uh, avocado air layer. So let me see. Yeah, this is the last one that I have in the slide. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Richie. You are the best. And I hope as well, you'll be bringing some pineapples to Snyder Park too, because they are so wonderful. And I hope wherever you are that you try growing a pineapple because it's really such a simple process. Um, something Richie showed me as well too, that I can show you right now on this pineapple. Um, this is a smooth cayenne. So this one came from a grocery store. Can you guys see me? No. Okay, I'm coming back. There I am. <laughs> okay, so um, here is the pineapple that I was showing you in the beginning. Man, it smells so good. It's ripe and ready for action. Um, but this is a smooth cayenne. It's not that um, Kona pineapple uh, that Richie was talking about, though I do have some of those outside, but that one's not ready yet. But any pineapple that you get, you're going to bring your pineapple home. Uh, you're going to remove this top piece. And I, at first, was just planting uh, my tops in the ground. So pineapples are in the same family as bromeliads. So bromeliads have these little catchers. They're actually the only bromeliad that produces a fruit. So they store water right here. They have the little crown. Um, but these bromeliads as well, too, they have these leaves down at the bottom. So if I remove slower leaves, <laughs> just one second. Um, you're going to notice some roots at the bottom already trying to get formed. 
So once again, it's essentially like that cutting technique again, where we're removing those lower leaves um, to just help it be easier for those roots to come out. And I've definitely noticed greater success from this technique that Richie taught me with this. So I'm kind of peeling off those lower leaves and hard to see, but there are these little nodes right here that are little roots that want to come out. So now I'd stick this into the soil to about the base of the crown right there. And it's a gorgeous potted plant, uh, no matter where you are. And like I said, nothing better than a homegrown pineapple, truly. Yeah, pineapple okay. can be grown. So, um, if you're in a cold climate, you can grow a pineapple and just bring it inside in the wintertime. Yeah, absolutely. So grow a pineapple today. Go, that's your homework after this. Go to the store, eat a pineapple tonight, um, and stick that pot in the top, um, top in a, a pot, pot top. <laughs> it's backwards. Um, and how long, Richie, how long does it take for a pineapple to produce a fruit? The crowns can take up to 24 months, from 16 to 24 months. That's the only bad thing you, they, you have to wait for them. Um, worth the slips, the wait, though. Yeah, definitely worth the wait. The slips will produce a pineapple in from 12 to 16 months. Okay. All right, so checking our time. Oh my God, it's 7.10. Okay, so seeds, obviously a very easy way to propagate things. So on the left, I'm holding Moringa seeds. Uh, here's a Moringa that came from outside. So Moringa inside these seed pods are seeds. I hope we don't get cut off at 715. So I'm just gonna kind of step it up a notch. Um, on the right is papaya. So I feel like nothing embodies the life force energy of seeds more than a papaya in my opinion. I believe in the next slide, yeah, on the left is a papaya. So if you slice open a papaya, there's an abundance of seeds inside. And so my favorite way to grow papaya is by simply scattering those seeds. Um, but if you think about it, one of those seeds is gonna produce one of these trees that produces all of this fruit that is filled with thousands of seeds. And so seeds, are definitely the strongest way to propagate plants, in my opinion. A, a tree grown from seed is oftentimes much stronger than something grown from a cutting, um, but it also takes longer as well too. And sometimes that air layering and grafting technique can be great because um, then trees are more true to form, but papayas actually aren't technically a tree, they're a giant herb. And so they'll produce once again, eight or nine months um, and all we need to do is just scatter those seeds. You can also dry them and save them. You can use papaya seeds like peppers. Um, another example of seed saving. So this is a loofah. Um, loofah is in the curcubit family. So it's related to uh, cucumber squash, as you can see on the left. But when we let them dry out, they form that loofah in the middle. Um, you can eat them when they're young, younger than what you see on the left, but they'll dry out inside forming a loofah sponge and then these black seeds will fall out. Uh, loofah is a climbing plant. And so if we want to save seeds, what we need to focus on is keeping seeds dry. And so to my right, right here, is my little seed bank. So. To start a seed bank, all you really need to do is just start saving jars, get a little bit of tape so you can label things, and have a couple plates so that way, like that Quimuck seed that I'm not going to forget about that's in my pocket, I'm going to go fish it out of my pocket. If I wasn't to plant that seed directly right now into my nursery, I would want to let it dry out before I put it in a jar, because if I put that seed directly into the jar, it's not dry and it's gonna have that moisture and it's going to start to rot or to mold. And so we always want our seeds to be as dry as possible. So what we have right here is burgundy okra from the Monarch Food Forest in summer 2020, so last summer. And so okra seeds are a great seed to save. So all I did was when an okra got nice and dry, I, um, open these seeds and you can really hear how dry they are too. Like if I,
drop it in there, you can hear, <laughs> I'm dropping okra seeds now, um, how dry they are. So when we're saving seeds, we always wanna focus on dryness, but not all seeds um, can be saved, especially in the tropics. So what is that alien baby you see on the right? Um, it is a mame seed and mame seeds you couldn't save. So you couldn't dry that seed. So once again, we can't go over every single plant, um, but if you really love mame and you, or you really love okra, focus on that one plant and just look up. Uh, the internet is an amazing resource to say, um, how long can I save a mame seed? How do I propagate a mame plant? Things like that. So yeah, always being sure to label as well too. Sometimes people will ask me how long seeds will last. Uh, once again, it always varies, but um, focusing as well on dryness, cool place. Uh, what you see on the left is one that I actually keep in my fridge as well too. But if you live in a temperate climate where you don't have to deal with humidity, it's much simpler to save seeds. But I have a pretty dried seed bank as well in this chest to my right that if somebody finds after I die, they're gonna be like, well, Megan is crazy. <laughs> She's got a lot of seeds saved. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think this is one of our last slides. So creating a nursery, we've already kind of talked about this, but what we can do when we say we wanna start taking cuttings, we wanna start saving seeds, um, we wanna start propagating plants, it's useful to create a little nursery. And the way that we do this is by finding a nice spot. So what you see on the right is my plant nursery on the side of my home. And so it's just a tiny alleyway, really. If you like, you probably have a couple feet to the left of what you're looking at right now. It's really not a big space, um, but it is on the east side of my home. And so it is not getting too much sunlight because the sun rises in the east. Uh, there's also oak trees overhead too. So it's kind of dappled light as you can see in that photo. On the left is a larger scale nursery from a site I worked at on the big island that had a shade cloth over the top, but that's like large scale. And I think most of us are dealing with smaller situations. So just focusing on like today, I brought some trees to a new job and we set up a makeshift nursery just in a shady area beneath a tree because we don't want our plants to be getting our young plants, our um, potted plants to be blasted by the sun because they're going to dry out faster. And as we talked about, we want to keep that soil fairly moist for the propagation process. Um, so kind of shady, kind of moist, getting a little bit of sunlight, but not too much. And you can see in the photo, what do we got? We got plumeria cutting, uh, papaya. And then one last note, an important part of the propagation cycle is pollinators. And so we can do all this work. We can propagate all these plants. We can air layer our trees. We can do all this stuff, but we got to have that piece of pollinators as well too. So because we are in the state that we are in right now, where pollinators are dying off, one thing that we can do is of course, support pollinators and plant, um, pollinator plants, host plants, nectaring plants in our garden, as well as our fruit trees and our uh, edible medicinal plants. Um, but also we can do some hand propagation as well too. So that essentially involves like transferring, like I'm looking at seminal pumpkin over here that's growing through the elderberry. And I have difficulty with those getting um, pollinated. Richie, today we were talking about anonas and I was talking about you because I was like, Richie's trying to figure it out on the anonas as well too. Uh, but there's like one wasp that pollinates um, soursops and anonas. So if you don't have that wasp around, sometimes you gotta take matters into your own hands and do hand pollination. Um, but also supporting our pollinators. What you see on the right is a wild beehive growing in an oak tree, probably about 20 feet up above my house. And on the left kind of brings full circle. There's a little bee on some elder flowers like we saw at the beginning. So we have reached the end of our slideshow. So what's going on this weekend that Richie was talking about? So for my local friends, this weekend is the grand opening of the Circle of Life Experience in Snyder Park, which is a project that is near and dear to my heart that we started two summers ago. 
um, using all these regenerative concepts. We have a butterfly garden, tropical regenerative garden, a food forest, orchard, lots of self-guided tours. And we're gonna be cutting a ribbon. I'll be giving a nature tour and we'll be doing a workshop on plant propagation there as well too. So you'll get to come home with some of these plants that you met today. I didn't show you these. So I really love tropical spinaches, but we'll definitely be sending home some, some tropical spinaches. Look at these cool purple leaves. They're all pretty saggy now because I took them about an hour ago. Another thing with cuttings as well too, we want to get them in the soil as soon as possible. If you take it at a friend's house, you can like put in a cup of water till you get home. Um, but yes, all this to say that I hope to see you on Saturday for our event. It's on Heal the Planet's website. And it's also on my page as well, too. So if you want to keep in touch, this is my email address with Heal the Planet. My name is Megan. Um, and if you want to follow along on my social media as well, too, um, my Instagram is New River Gardens. And I try and post as much educational content as I can. I posted about this class on there today. So um, if you'd like to log on there and be friends and keep in touch, and I would love to as well see some of the propagation techniques that you learned in this class, you are welcome to connect with me on any of these mediums. Also as well, as Noelia mentioned, feel free to follow Heal the Planet um, on Facebook, social media. And we went a couple minutes over, but I hope that you have fun tonight, dear friends. Oh my God, we have eight messages in the chat. So Noelia wrote, Heal the Planet calendar link. So that's all of our events. So our next workshop is on, it's been the longest day of my life today. So I'm, <laughs> I can't remember what our next workshop is on, but it's always on the third Thursday of the month. We have two more for our summer series. Oh, I see Noelia, would you like to say something? Yes, it's actually this Saturday we have plant propagation. Yeah, so this Saturday is in-person plant propagation, but our next online workshop would be... Oh, so I can, if you go to the calendar link, you'll find it. We'll, we're going to get a new link and I'll send you information tomorrow as well. Awesome. So yeah, thank you all for your positive feedback in the chat. I'm glad you had some good vibes. I'm glad you had fun. And I... Hope that you all learned something tonight that helps you feel a little bit more empowered as a grower. You don't have to go out and buy stuff. That's the common story that when we start something new, we're like, man, I got to go drop some money on my garden that I'm going to buy. But you can just simply connect with your place, go for a walk maybe this evening after our call and just notice some trees going around you that you like. I can't remember the one that was, it was a chrysanthemum, I believe someone was saying before. Um, but maybe go visit that chrysanthemum and like visit the neighbor as well too and be like, <laughs> tell me about your chrysanthemum. And it's a great way to connect with neighbors, connect more deeply with the plants growing in your place and also have a lovely evening where you're able to bring some stuff home to your garden and keep that story going. So does anybody have any more questions? I'll stay on the call for a minute or two longer. Once again, you're also able to reach out to Noelia or I um, through Heal the Planet's website or at, uh, on my email or on our social media. But I thank you all for being here tonight and I hope to see you on Saturday in Snyder Park or for that SoFlo Vegans event that Noelia mentioned for the local friends and if not for my remote friends Thank you for being here tonight. Happy propagating. And I um, hope to see you on our next online workshop, which would be the third Thursday of <clears throat> July, August. And Richie, I just heard Richie too. Thank you to Richie again. You did. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And great job, Megan. <laughs> Good <As night>. usual. <laughs> You're awesome. You're awesome. I'll see you this weekend. All righty. Bye. All right, I'll see you. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Megan and Richie. Hope you, I hope you saw that. Um, all right, you guys. Well, if there's no more questions, then we will call it a night. I am sending love to each and every one of you, and that's all for now. Good night.